welcome to the signal pad. If you recall a while ago, I did a full review of the Dino Light USB based microscopes, and I showed that these units have fairly good optical performance. They have also other interesting features like polarization control, photograph stacking, depth of field control, as well as doing the various measurements of distance and dimensions. And these have been very handy because I've been using them for a lot of my videos, and every time I show you a close up of a die or a module or component, that's the microscope I've been using. Well, Dino Light hasn't been standing around, and they have produced used a whole bunch of new products with additional features and improvements which are quite exciting and I have a few of them here that I'd like to go over with you and I've prepared some experiments and some demonstrations to see uh, how these things behave. Some of them have specialized use, some of them are more general purpose use and uh, they now have USB based uh, ones as well that go up to 5 megapixels so you have very high resolution which is excellent uh, they have HDMI direct out up to 60 frames per second this is very useful and, uh, and especially if you want to use it for soldering so we can take a look and see how this is for live preview for applications like that and some with light pipe uh, that give you hundreds of times of magnification, six, seven hundred times, so we can use those to look at a die uh, which would be quite interesting to see very fine features a good platform to use the high magnification microscope is the Motion M1. And the reason, as I said earlier, is because you don't want to be touching the microscope when you have such a high magnification and such a shallow depth of field. And a motorized system which has very high resolution in, in steps would be excellent for that purpose, and this uh, unit here provides that. Now, the X-direction movement is controlled by a belt connected to a stepper motor, as you can see. And belt-driven systems aren't necessarily the best uh, simply because of the repeatability and the resolution they provide, but nonetheless, I think it works uh, reasonably well. And uh, for X movement, definitely, it has no issue. Now, similarly, the arm is also controlled by a belt and is also connected to a stepper motor all the way at the back of the unit, and this also seems to be working reasonably well. Now, everything is very solid and held together quite rigid, which is nice, exactly what you want. You don't want things to be loose and rattling around so that your repeatability is good, and we will see that when we're doing our, our measurements afterwards. Now, the vertical movement is controlled by a worm screw, as you can see here, connected to a stepper motor at the base there, and that's excellent because it gives you very good vertical resolution here, which you will need if you want to do depth measurements and also to focus at such a high magnification. So I'm pretty happy with these uh, features. Now there's a couple of switches at the very end. There's a switch right here, for example, and this switch will be used to zero out the unit. So when you turn it on, it will move the platform until the switch is activated, and then it knows how many steps it takes to move the platform all the way to the end. Unfortunately, there is no switch on the other end, so it relies on counting the steps to make sure that you don't crash the platform all the way to the other end, and I haven't had an issue. It, it, it knows and it keeps track of it. It seems to be working uh, fairly well. I wish it had a switch at the other end. I think dual protection is always a good thing. Similarly here, there is only one protection and as, as well as the vertical movement as well. Now, uh, this has a controller which is on the other side and I will show you that in just a second. And just by looking at it, I think it might be fairly well uh, hackable because it uses a COM port uh, to move the platform around. And I would imagine that if you own one of these, you can even dual purpose it. Uh, put maybe a laser engraver in there or put something else in there that you can uh, do movement, uh, make uh, some kind of uh, automated system with that. And that's excellent. We love uh, that type of hackable systems for sure. And uh, the other nice feature it has is that this platform is actually controlled by springs. So it's, it's sitting on a few springs. Now, springs have a few advantages. First of all, uh, if you crash the microscope into it when you're not careful, it gives you at least a little bit of give so that it doesn't cause too much damage to the microscope. But really, the main advantage of it that I like is that it allows you very, very fine focus adjustments in case when you need to make a tiny adjustment. And this is very handy when you have such a high magnification. Uh, one of the things it doesn't have, which I wish it did, is a platform to allow rotation so that you can rotate the object you want to look at right on the platform and if it's not sitting straight, you wouldn't have to actually touch the object. That's the only thing uh, that is missing. Even if it was manual, I'd be happy with that. Maybe there is a, an attachment that can be made with it with a little uh, rotation here where you can rotate the platform. It shouldn't be too difficult to add to something like this. So now we can go ahead and turn it on and see how it behaves. And so far, I haven't had any major issue with it. The, the software that came out uh, with it right now is the complete software. seems to be working fairly well, which we will, of course, see. Let me show you the other side before we do some experiments. And here's the other side, and all the connections you need is just one USB to the computer and the power which comes from the power supply that is provided with it. It's quite a large power supply. And uh, I haven't opened this to take a look inside of it. We can maybe leave that for another time uh, to save some time. But there is a micro SD card reader on here, so maybe some automated measurements can be made. But I'm fairly sure that this should be easily hackable for other purposes, and that's uh, great in my opinion. 
So now that we have it set up like this, you can see I have the high magnification um, unit right over here with the light pipe in it. And I have this uh, that I want to take a look at. I'm going to take a, give you a little bit of a hint on what that is. So we can go from there, but let's first turn it on and see what it does when it's initialized the first time. So here we go. I'm going to turn it on, and it gets recognized by the computer as a COM port. We can connect to it. And once it connects to it, it's going to basically bring it to a zero position. There you go. As you can see, it does some measurements, so it knows exactly where the beginning or the origin is. And it's designed such that you will not crash the microscope into the platform during initialization. So if you're not careful, it's really quite uh, kind of foolproof in that sense. So let's see what it does once it stops. And then I can put it to the park position, which is a position I've defined earlier. So we can park it. There it is. Not too bad. It's quite nice. And now it's waiting for us to do whatever we want. And let's we can jump to the software and see what it can do in the software. Now, before that, let me show you what this is. So this is a little unit which I actually used in one of my other videos. This is an RGB sensor. So what it does is that it gives you the intensity of red, green, and blue lights. And uh, there is a little white LED in here. So you can actually use this to measure color. By illuminating the white LED, you can illuminate the surface, and the reflected light is picked up by the sensor into the red, green, and blue analog values. And you can use that to uh, estimate the color and so on. So I'm curious to see what the dye of this looks like, because this is going to be a very complex and interesting little dye, because not only does it have silicon for you know amplification and photo detection and so on and on, it must also have some kind of filter, because it does red, green, and blue separately. And I'm very eager to see what it looks like once we put it under the microscope. So let's give it a try. So for this experiment, we'll be looking at the AM7515 MT8A microscope. Now this is a very high magnification unit, and it supports magnifications from 700 to 900 times, and obviously is intended for very fine features and very small devices. This is why we're looking at, for example, a dye under the microscope, because this is exactly what this is intended for. And it supports a respectable resolution of 2592 by 1944 pixels, and it has a USB 2.0 interface, not a USB 3.0 interface, and so the frame rate is a little bit lower than we get with some of the other microscopes. Now the, it does have automatic magnification reading. And the reason this is important is because it knows what magnification the microscope is set to, and therefore it knows what the dimensions of the object is that it's looking at once it's in focus. It knows how big something is to fill the frame. It means we can do measurements directly on the image as we are doing um, our measurements and looking at different parts of the unit. This can be very helpful, particularly when looking at really tiny components. And some of the other features you can see down here, for instance, that it has a 5 megapixel sensor at 30 frames per second through USB 2.0 under ideal lighting conditions. Now, one of the other things to note is that the working distance here in millimeters is quite small. So the frame rate isn't really that important because it's not like you're going to be doing live work under this microscope anyway. It's really mostly intended for examination and doing measurements and distances and things of that nature, not really for live work. But nonetheless, we will take a look and see how it behaves directly in our setup here. It costs about 1249, so it's not a cheap microscope. None of the DinoLite microscopes are particularly cheap, but again, they come with a software warranty and build quality and image quality they would expect from them. So whether they are suitable for your application is obviously up to you. So now let's go ahead and see what we can take a look. And here we have the Dino Capture 2.0 application. This is a nice platform because it would allow you to connect all of your microscopes to the same software. And they would show up on different tabs here. So you can have them side by side. You can be looking at multiple things at the same time, doing measurements, capturing images and videos uh, all together in one software, which is quite nice and very handy. And we'll take a look at some of its features. On the right side, we have the Vision S1. This is a software to control the Motion M1 platform. And you can see very familiar controls you would find on any typical CNC machine. And this would allow you to manipulate the X, Y, and Z positions of the microscope right here from the software while you're looking at it through the Dino Capture uh, view here. So if you look at the X and Y distance there, you have a resolution of 0.1 millimeters. So that's the smallest step you can take in X and Y direction. You can go all the way to 50 millimeters as well. On the Z distance, the smallest is 0.02 millimeter. And this is very important because on high magnification microscopes, your depth of field is so shallow, if you're not able to make very fine steps, you're simply not going to be able to stay in focus. Now this similarly goes to 50 uh, millimeters there per step. And the speed can be adjusted and you can park it and set zeros and all the typical stuff you would expect to see from a software like this for controlling a, an XYZ manipulated platform there. Now here, if you look carefully, we're actually focused on the surface of the package 
of the RGB sensor I was just showing you. So you can see some minor imperfections and blemishes on the plastic surface of the package. Remember, this package is transparent because light needs to go through it, but it's not perfect and on a microscopic level, it's going to have imperfections. And I can change the Z distance and, and get some uh, finer focus and depending on you know this where I'm looking at. Now remember that this is not level at all. The whole module is not level. So you're gonna see a gradient of focus. This is not the fault of the microscope. This is just simply because the platform is not completely level. So what if I wanna measure the depth of the package and see how thick that package is? Well, this Vision S1 software allows me to do that. So right now I'm focused on the surface of the package. So let's start our depth measurement ability here. So now we have a depth, uh, depth distance of zero and I'm going to change my focus until I focus on the surface of the die that's inside the package. So let's do that. We can go down further and you can see we are going out of focus on the package and eventually we're going to start seeing some of the features of the die. We are beginning to already see some wire bond. We're going to go further down and eventually we're going to be focused on the surface of the die itself. And you know, we are roughly there, I think, somewhere around here. So now if you look here, you can see the wire bonds coming in. And if I go end, you can see it gives me now the depth distance. So now I have an 180 micron, 0.18 millimeter is the thickness of the package, the plastic over the die. And that sounds about right. So that's quite nice to see. Now, one of the things I noticed is that even though the distance travel is 0.02 millimeter, it's not very consistent. It doesn't always do 0.02. Sometimes it's a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. So if you can see if I go up by one and come down by one, I don't get to the exact same focus point I had before. So I'm gonna have to play around with it until I get the focus that I want. And it's a little bit of an imperfection in the software, but overall by playing around with it, you can get around this limitation. I wish it was a little bit more accurate. Now, if you look here, you can see some interesting features already. Now this green area is metal and you can see underneath the metal is where all the circuitry actually is hidden. So these are all the little uh, interconnects. These are very small, small features here. And the little interconnects between transistors and between different uh, amplifiers and whatever that's required to make this work, these are all under a top level metal. And there's holes in it probably because of density regulations for the ASIC manufacturing. And uh, everything is blocked by metal because it's obviously protects it against light that's coming down, which you want to do because this is a transparent package. And also in general for good routing of power and ground signals, this is a typical technique. Now, if I were to start moving the distance here, let me reset this and let's go down and then you're gonna see the coolest features of the die here. And check it out. This die actually has RGB filters directly on top of the sensor. You can see we're going out of focus here because it's not level. So let's go ahead and try focusing again. You have to go the other way. Now, one of the other things that I want to point out is that you're, I'm doing screen capture and at the same time I am recording from the uh, USB going into the computer. So there's going to be a significant delay uh, and pause because of that. So if you, whatever you're seeing on, on your screen because of the video capture is much slower than what I'm actually looking at. So this does not represent the speed of the microscope. And look at this, how beautiful and cool these are. So these are the RGB little uh, sensors there and underneath them is the same detector. But by filtering the light using these little glass filters, you will be able to then filter the lights that you don't want to measure. And this is how they separate RGB from each other. It's not the sensor itself can, that can discern the wavelength of light. It's actually the filter that's on top of the detectors itself. And we can do a measurement and see how big these things are. So let's go a measurement from here and over here. So one of our pixels is 0.078 millimeters, so about 80 micron. That's the size of each of these glass pieces. So it's very cool to see uh, these features in, in play actually. Now if I go back up here, I go closer back to where one of the pads are, I can measure the size of a pad. Now, I gotta get rid of this one because we don't need this anymore. So let's measure the size of a pad here. These pads are about 100 micron. So that's a typical size pad. This is a 100 by 100 micron pad, very common, uh, good for wire bonding, as you can see, and then refocusing a little bit there. Very nice uh, features that you can observe here. Now I can continue moving around and see if there is any other interesting feature on this die and see if there is any anywhere where there is any marking or any writing on it. Let's see, let's increase the distance we travel. Again, you can see, oops, I moved away. You can see everything is out of focus. Again, this is because it, it's not it's not level. There we go. We got some some writing here on this die. There we got some numbers there. No, no, they really don't mean anything, but it's interesting. It looks like they have 
they have drawn different uh, layers of the metal there and they have written different numbers on top of it. I'm not sure exactly what they're doing, but this feature here, that almost seems like a, a piece of dirt or something that's been trapped inside the package because I don't think this is really connected to anything. It's not a wire bond, the wire bonds uh, look like this. So yeah, very cool little the details you can see here. And this is not an RFIC, it's just an ASIC, so it doesn't have any inductors that we could look at, but I do have something that has inductors on it. So I wanna show you some inductors that are actually implemented directly on an RFIC. And here's another circuit that I want to show you. This is something I made about 10 years ago when I was a graduate student. This is a 30 giga sample per second track anode amplifier. And it was done either in a 0.13 micron CMOS process or a 65 nanometer CMOS process. I can't remember anymore. But we can talk about some of the interesting features we can see using the microscope. So here are the input pads. And by the fact that this area itself is in focus and this area is not in focus, it's because the pads are at a higher layer. This is an aluminum pad opening. You can see that's why the color is different, uh, just because the other one is buried under the oxide layer. And I, could, I should be able to zoom out a little bit more. So you can see we are now focused on the pads and on the little inductors that are series peaking from the pads themselves. These pads are quite huge, obviously, but the inductors are small. We can measure an inductor. So this inductor is about 35 micron across. Very small one, and this is done on the top metal layer. Now, if I focus on a lower layer, you will be able to see some more of the features. Let me see if I can get a good focus on there. There you go. So now you see the exact signal flow through these differential CML amplifiers. And if you look carefully, you can even see some more inductors which are at the lower level in the metal. That's what you can see through this because this is a silicon oxide at the top, but these inductors are also very small. But they're still much larger than normal transistors would be, of course, but nonetheless, these are used for series and shunt peaking between the CML amplifiers. The front amplifier is a trans impedance amplifier. This is a, in series with the RF feedback network, and here's our main transistor in the middle there and you can go forward and you can see some more CMOS transistors along the way. These are microstrip transmission lines connecting the stages together. And uh, these, uh, let me see how thick they are. Can we measure them? Uh, yeah, about three or four microns. That sounds about right. Yeah, about three or more four micron line width on these uh, lines between the stages. That's yeah, fairly normal. These squares that you see are metal fill done by the foundry in order to create a uniform metal density across the IC. And these stages are pretty close to each other. So this stage, from the first stage to the second stage, we're talking about about 100 micron apart, which is you know, fairly large and it's de determined really by the dimensions of the inductors and passives. Other than that, there's no, no reason why they have to be this far apart. Now, if I continue on, you can see the signal flow. And at some point, you can see we're going down here. This is the output. And the top coming in is the clock, the 30 gigahertz clock for clocking the track and hole amplifier itself. Now, if I remember correctly, somewhere in here, I actually wrote my name. There it is. I wrote my name in Japanese, uh, my middle name in Japanese uh, when I wrote this, just for fun. And I should be able to focus on that too. A little bit more, let me see if I can get a good focus on it. There it is. And this is also pretty large, I would imagine. Uh, this chip is actually mostly empty. This uh, 160 micron was the size of this little graphic that I put there. So a clock's coming down here, and if I go further down, we will eventually reach the output pads. And there they are, these are the output pads, and we should be able to focus on them as well. There you go. You can see all the nice features inside the IC there. These are some more series peaking at the output driver, which drives the pads. This big structure that you see here is a decoupling capacitor, which are scattered throughout the IC for creating good ground and VDD connection there. So yeah, other than that, very simple and a nice microscope. You can see exactly this feature. This table really does help uh, for sure. I see, you can see some dark regions around this area where the light uh, comes through and it doesn't, doesn't have sufficient lighting outside of this and it sees a dark region. So it's a little bit uh, unfortunate that it doesn't have full frame coverage. But other than that, yeah, looks good. I think uh, hopefully this gives you an idea of what this uh, unit can do in combination with the Motion M1 platform. So the next step is to try a different microscope and look at something so the next microscope that I want to look at is the AM73915MZT. Now this particular unit is now a USB 3 option and the cable is detachable from the metallic body of the microscope itself. I really like these detachable cables because it makes it so much easier to store and manipulate these microscopes, especially if you have a couple of them. So I don't like the ones where the cable is permanently attached to the unit. 
This particular one can go from 20 to 220 times magnification, making it a perfect all-around USB microscope, suitable for a variety of applications. It's probably the one that I'd be using most often. Same high resolution, 2592 by 1944 pixels. Now, because it does have a USB 3 option, at lower resolutions, you can go all the way up to 45 frames per second. But at a full 5 megapixel megapixels per second, you cannot hit those frame rates, of course. Same automatic magnification reading is possible, so you can do measurements directly on the screen. It also has flexible LED light control too. So each quadrant of the light that's built into the head of the microscope can be turned on and off individually, along with a polarizer, so you can ad adjust the polarization of the light. This is really helpful depending on what you're looking at, because de depending on the shadow it casts, depending on the surface reflectivity, you'd want to turn on and off lights and change the polarization so you can get a nice crisp image on the screen. So I'm pretty happy with this particular one. Also it costs around $1,400. Again, these are not cheap, uh, but uh, this is something that you'd have to put against the uh, software and performance and image quality, of course. And then here you can see some more specifications that are uh, about it here. But the, the most notable is that at a magnification of about 20, you have 60 millimeters of work distance. So this distance is now big enough that you can easily work underneath it if you want to. But keep in mind that because of the frame rate, it may not necessarily be suitable for live soldering because the delay might be too much uh, and the, the frame rate may not be high enough, depending on what you're used to. I, I could do it occasionally and I've done it before in the past, but I still obviously would prefer something that's live, like a Mantis or something that's over 60 frames per second. And they do have a model like that, which we will take a look at at the end. So enough about this. Let's go and take a look at something under the microscope. So here we have the Anritsu 10 GHz 28 dB amplifier here focused on under the microscope and I'm only looking at the active region in the middle of the unit and you can clearly see that it's made of a whole bunch of discrete components. So we have a three stage amplifier, here's one stage, this is an active device here, here's the second stage and here's the third stage and each stage is separated from the stage before it with an AC coupled capacitor and the biasing network required to bias the input and the output of each active amplifier. On the left, we have a coplanar waveguide part coming in, and you can see it reaches a point, it's AC coupled at the all the way on the left, and it reaches a point, narrows down to a point where we can do wire bonding, and the wire bonding connects to the input of the first amplifier at the same time to the biasing network. And the output of the amplifier is then connected to this resistor here for biasing the output portion of the amplifier and, an, and a vertical capacitor which is wire bonded to the next stage. And this is how they separate various stages from each other so that they can be each one individually biased. So three stages of amplification can be clearly seen and it goes to the output, again similarly AC coupled to the output uh, connector there. Everything else is just for biasing. But it's really nice to see all the details and how easy it is to see them under this uh, magnification level. Now all the features such as extent net depth of field can be seen here so you can automatically take multiple pictures and stack them and the software will process it for you and will give you a crisp image at different depths of fields. And you can clearly see here, for example, this wire flying over this, this wire bond ribbon flying over these capacitors there is not in focus. But if I were to adjust the focus manually, I will be able to get that component in focus. But then as soon as I do that, I will then lose the focus of the components underneath. And that's how you can do focus stacking. There it is. Now we are focused on this wire, but not on everything underneath it. And if I hover over this, you can see that it will go through all of the possible focuses. Then it will stack the photos if I want to. So that's very useful and will give you a very nice images that I've shown in, in some of my previous videos there. So now you can clearly see uh, various components and I can move it around and keep in mind again, the frame rate here is significantly lower than what I see is because of the video capture. But uh, let's look, for example, a little bit up, or I should say down. Here you go, this is the, some of the circuitry at the bottom to bias it. And if I go from the other side, you will be able to see, there you go, some of the other wire bonding going to some of the other sections there. And I, I should be able to focus on that too. For example, let's say if I wanted to take a look at this portion, I would be able to easily, of course, focus on the top and you will be able to take a look at that as well. We can also focus much more and look at the details of the dyes a lot more. So let's do that. And here's a close look at one of the amplification stages and you can see here the vertical capacitor used to bias the input and the vertical capacitor used to bias the output. Here's the resistor on this side for biasing the output section and this resistor all the way down here is used to bias the input section and of course this is from the previous stage. We can make some measurements. The active device itself is quite small. We're looking at 0.3 
millimeter by 330 micron and, and the distance between two amplifying stages can also be measured in a similar way. Let me get rid of this, we don't need it. And from one amplifier stage to another amplifier stage, we're looking at 1.2 millimeter. So these are our very small uh, dimensions there to, to deal with. And as you can clearly see also, some of the other features are pretty interesting. For instance, the epoxy used to hold these devices down. These are all done by hand. Wire bonding marks where they have squished the wire bond down to make sure that it makes a good contact, either by ultrasonic welding or some other technique used to connect these. And it's very cool. And I can also turn on the lights uh, on and off in different uh, lighting modes. So for example, this is another lighting mode, so it gives you some more details or I can turn the light completely off and this is the ambient light obviously you can't see anything with just the ambient light and I can turn individual lights on and off and you can see effects of how that will change the way some of the features show up and some of the features don't show up if I turn opposite lights on for example so you can see different shadows being cast depending on the illumination source this can be very useful especially when you have weird dimensions looking at it under the microscope and of course the intensity can then be adjusted and so on and i suggest you play around with this software uh, when you get a chance it's it's quite quite a nice set of features so this next unit is definitely one of my favorite simply because of its huge working distance this is optimized for long working distances right now this item over here is actually in focus and we have a huge distance here that we can work with. You can do soldering or active repair directly under the microscope and with 45 frames per second it's quite usable. But let's go to the computer and take a look at the specification and see what the image looks like. And here is the AM73115 MTF, the ultra long working distance USB 3 version of the microscope, same metallic construction, removable cable, which is very nice, supporting 10 to 70 times optical magnification. This is exactly the kind of range you would need for soldering or active repair. It's really a very nice image quality, as you will see. It supports resolutions the same way, all the way to 2592 by 1944 pixels and a USB 3 connection. And it also has this flexible LED control. Unfortunately, it doesn't have active readback of the magnification, so you can't do uh, uncalibrated measurements directly on the screen. But this is a one, uh, one limitations of this particular model. And going down here, you can see again 5 megapixel camera there, 45 frames per second, not in the 5 megapixel mode, but in the lower resolution. And we will take a look at that as well. Now, if you look here at 70 times 70 magnification, you have 115 millimeters of working distance. Now, at 30 magnification, you have eight, uh, 186 millimeters, so 18.6 centimeter, or down here you can see 7.3 inches. That's more than enough to do active work there. And I'm eager to show you the image quality and what we can do with this microscope. So let's take a look. And here is the image from this microscope, and you can see various components very clearly and if I move the LCD module, which is whatever it is that we're looking at here, you can see various other features of it along with the quality of the solder mask, the vias, and this would be very easy to solder under of course. Now again the frame rate here does not do it justice, this is because of the video capture. In reality in the low resolution mode you can get all the way up to 45 frames per second. Now one thing to note here is that unfortunately this particular microscope doesn't come with polarization control, the light control. So which means that if I were to turn the lights on completely, I, I tend to get a very high level of reflection on the board and there's nowhere for, no way for me to correct this. The other microscopes have polarization rotation and you can correct this glare. So it turns out if I turn the light off completely and just use my ambient light in the lab, I get the best results from this microscope. Or you can turn the light very lo a little and then you also get uh, some reasonably good quality coming out of it. Now if I were to put down, put under it the module we were looking at before, the one that we were just looking at, and you can see various features of this one. This is what exactly the same thing we were looking at, except now we're looking at it from much, much farther away. But you still get very good uh, focus here. So let me, a very good resolution here. So let me get uh, see if I can uh, get a good focus on this. Yes, the height of these modules are quite different from each other. And we're almost there. There you go. You can see much more nicely from farther away exactly all the different features. So yeah, it works really well. This definitely, if, if it had polarization control, it for sure would be uh, one of my favorite ones. Now, if I were to turn the light on on here, uh, you can see on this particular surface, yeah, you get some washed out details, but it's somewhat usable compared to the other ones. If I turn the light all the way to the maximum, you get washed out all these features. And if I turn the light completely off, completely off, you actually get, in my view, you get the best image quality here. 
Now this is definitely my favorite setup. This is the brand new DynaLite DVI output microscope. This is a 720p direct output at 60 frames per second under good lighting conditions, which is a fully independent microscope, doesn't need the computer. DVI output can directly go to a monitor and it's of course powered externally with a wall adapter. But I have connected it here to this external monitor that I have and I've been using it for some time now. It's definitely my favorite one and it supports magnifications from about 10 to 220 and at 60 frames per second when the lighting is good it works really really well. So here I have another amplifier under the microscope and I want to show you exactly what it looks like and as we manipulate it around here in this uh, situation where I'm filming with my camera at 60 frames per second you can get a much better idea of the speed and the refresh rate of the microscope. So let's take a look and this one also actually has a polarizing light which is great because you really need it depending on what it is that you're looking at. So now we can go and take a close look at this amplifier module. So let's take a look and see what we have here. So we're looking at the full amplifier and you can see the input of the amplifier is here, the output of the amplifier is there, and there's a whole bunch of circuitry all around it. So let's do some analysis on this. First thing is, this is very responsive. And here I'm moving that around and you can see that the image moves around very quickly. So we're definitely looking at somewhere between uh, 45 to 60 frames per second. So I'm very happy with it. And if I point to something here, imagine this being the tip of a soldering iron, I have very good feedback from the screen, so I should be able to do live work on this without any issues. And I obviously also have polarization control. You can see I can rotate the polarization and various other features will pop depending on the polarization. I like this one all the way to the edge on this mode because it represents the closest colors to what I'm seeing with my eyes. These are ceramic substrates which are white, which is exactly what we expect to see. So now we can focus in a little bit more or zoom in a little bit more at some of the other features so we can do a close analysis. So let's go a little bit further down and refocus and bring it over here. Let me do a nice focusing on this little portion so we can analyze it one step at a time. Here we go. So this is our first input amplifier. This is a pre-amplifier stage. You can see signal coming over here and it splits into two in this power divider. And then we have two amplifiers and then we combine them back again. So it's a power combining amplifier, very classic architecture. The output of that then goes forward again. And you can see we have another amplifying stage right over here after a few matching components. And then we continue on to another dedicated ASIC as the final power amplifier of this amplifier chain and then a filter at the output directly to the pin. These, are, these have K connectors, I believe. Yes, they do. This is a very high frequency amplifier. I believe it uh, goes up to about 20 or 30 gigahertz. I can't quite remember at the moment. But uh, you can see a whole bunch of other interesting features. Here are some resistors. These are snaked resistors with different pads so you can wire one to whichever one you want so you can potentially trim them. So let's take a closer look. Let me bring the microscope all the way down, as close as I can to the module here. And this will then allow us to focus again. And there we go. So now we are really, really looking as close as we possibly can. The microscope can't go any lower than this uh, in reality unless I take the cap off in the front. So there we go. Now we can see these resistors that I was referring to, these resistors over here have different pads, so depending on which one you wire bond to, you are going to get a different resistor value. And this die here at the top, well, let's change the polarization, see if we can get some more details to pop out of that. There you go, you can see some of the transistors inside. It's difficult to tell exactly the architecture of this amplifier. We would have to use the microscope that I showed you at the very beginning of the video to look very closely at hundreds of times magnification. Here again, some more vertical decoupling capacitors. These are all ceramic, connecting them together. And let's move a little bit further down. Let me move the microscope a little bit higher so it's easy to manipulate. And let me refocus. And let's look over here next to the capacitors. And we have this device here. So if you look closely, I think this is a voltage regulator. This is the output transistor of the voltage regulator. Here's the up and feedback at the input. So this is a voltage regulator to bias some of the devices inside, uh, potentially adjustable. Here's the resistor here. You can clearly see it. Uh, this might be a hybrid device, perhaps maybe another capacitor of some kind. There is another ASIC down here, potentially for another voltage regulator or some other functionality is not very clear. And uh, going back up here, you can see these other tantalum capacitors are massive. And we go back up here so we can see the ASIC very clearly. Here is another, the second amplifier stages. 
There we go, we are now better focused. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of decoupling caps. You can see there are distributed decoupling caps all over the place. Yeah, very nice, simple structure, obviously all handmade and uh, hand assembled. These look like various trimming components put on there, potentially for tuning the different uh, portions of this power divider. Very interesting structure. My God, there's so much manual work on this. It's, it's crazy. All of this would be very easily into an integrated circuit, depending on the power handling capability. Gallium arsenic, like gallium nitride, you know, phosphide process can easily do this. And then, of course, silicon germanium as well. Yeah, very nice, uh, very nice design and uh, very nice microscope. I really like this one. This is definitely the one that I would be using most often in my work, especially because I don't need a computer. I could just have this monitor on the side and it would allow me to take a look. Now, at this magnification, we are sitting basically right on top of the module. You're not going to be able to do any soldering at this distance. It's just for examination. But I do believe that there is a long working distance version of this microscope as well. Probably wouldn't be able to do 220 times magnification, but it would certainly be very useful uh, for some of the uh, soldering applications at a slightly further distance. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this video. This was just scratching the surface of all the capabilities and all the models that Dynalight has to offer. And hopefully you will find something that fits within your workflow, depending on the price performance ratio that you think is suitable. Either way, if you like this video, please let me know in the comment section. If you have any questions, I uh, do my best to answer them. I'm working on a couple of other reviews and hopefully they'll be out soon. I'll see you next time.